We started with Model 1, the foundation of the Christian faith, and we talk about the importance of foundation and foundation. The importance of foundation can never be overemphasized. And what do I mean by that? Even if you start from today to talk about it till the end of this year, you will not have done justice to it. The reason is because when anything is starting, when we want to begin anything, most of the time, cautions are thrown into the air and they were not careful to lay proper foundation because when it has to do with foundation, it takes time and it's cumbersome and it is um, it's dragging. It's, it takes a lot of time. It takes, sometimes it takes a lot of money in terms of physical structures. It takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of mental energy, physical energy, and all of that. And not everybody, not everybody is ready to do that. You can imagine somebody who wants to build 10-story building in Ireland or mainland here, and you actually want to build it in such a way that it will not collapse. It's going to take you time. You're going to dig deep and deep and deep until you get to, just like we want to, uh, until you get to the appropriate um, depth that will be able to say yes, you can erect this building in this kind of foundation and it will stand and last. It takes a lot of time. And so those who are not interested, for example, two people want to set out, they want to build a house, one two-story building for that matter, and maybe on a swampy land or maybe on a sandy land, level ground, sandy. Then the other person, one person just dig like one foot and they put his foundation and blocks and start raising it up. Then the other one is still digging like two, three feet deep or four feet deep. While he's going down, the other one is going up. And by the time he goes to the end where he's going to start the foundation, this one that is going up was have finished the first floor. And one thing we don't remember or we don't recognize is that anything that you are doing in this life, it's going to stand the test. This time, is going to test it. This world is going to test it. This life is going to test it. Whether it is anything at all that you are doing, you're going to, it's going to be tested. There are things that are going to come after it. And so how you have built that foundation is what determines whether it's going to survive it or not. That's why I keep saying the importance of foundation can never be overemphasized. And the foundation we know, the foundation of the Christian faith being Jesus Christ. That man, Jesus Christ, we must know him. We must know his capabilities. We must know his ab abilities. We must understand his dependability. We must know who he is, his character, what he's able to do and what he's not able to do. And the extent to which you know him is the extent to which you commit your life to him. Because that is actually the big bedrock of every other thing. Whether you, you have faith or you don't have faith is as a result of this same man, Jesus Christ. Whether How strong your faith is, is the extent to which you trust him. And I've said it, everything that we see happening in the life of every Christian, whether you are a bishop or, or whatever you call your name, everything boils down to the foundation. When you see someone who is not obeying the word of God, the reason is because he doubts God. He doesn't believe or he doesn't trust him. Because if you trust him and believe him, you will know to keep his commandment, to do what he tells you to do. So everything boils down to trust Trust, trust. Another word for it is faith, faith. Another word for it is believe, believe, believe in him. It's about trusting him. And the struggle we, we face in trusting him is because we are dealing with intangible things, things that you cannot see, things that the mind cannot relate with. Because we live in this side of life where we calculate, reason every single thing and all of that. And if you want to do that with him, you are not going to succeed. You will fail. So you learn the principles of faith because it's actually faith that separates us as Christians. So having discussed about the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and I made mention the fact that the reason why a lot of us have a shaky foundation or our faith is very feeble is simply because we have a distorted view or mind about Jesus Christ and what he does his purpose, his objective in our lives. What has Jesus Christ come to do in our lives? 
What has the Holy Spirit come to do in our lives? What has God come to do in our lives? I was just thinking just before I left the house, I said, I, I looked through the window, I saw beside my house, you know, that empty space. These are bulky people yeah, living there now with all kinds of... So I said to myself, from the day you were born till you die, so why you came into this life? It's just about your stomach to find food to eat, to find food to eat, to find food to eat. So just walk, get food, eat. Is that why God brought you into this? So I was looking at them. I said, does it mean that this, so this man or these people, they don't know, they don't understand the reason why they are here. So everything is about, just everything they do from the beginning to the end is about what to eat and about what to drink. That is just it, nothing else. You leave the house in the morning, you work so hard, you come back, you are tired, you rest, and then they cook, you eat, then tomorrow you wake up, and then you go out again, and then the same thing. It's just about this tomorrow. So I say to myself, is that the reason why God Almighty sent Jesus Christ here to die? to redeem us so that we can have food to eat inside, put food inside our stomach, buy clothes to wear, have a house, build a house and live inside it. In this, is that just, if that is the reason, then God, God is not, is not so intelligent. If that is the reason, God is not so intelligent. Because the resources he invested in creating the world, the resources he invested in redeeming man, and all of that could not just be that people just gather together, just just live their life and eat food and buy car and drive and all of If that is the only reason why he sent, then I don't think his God is not that intelligent. But that is not the reason. There are much, much more reason to it. And so when we understand it, we commit ourselves, it will help you. So until you, you see, uh, some of us, if you are not the inquisitive type, if you are not inquisitive, if you don't ask questions, deep questions to yourself, ask certain questions, there are things you cannot, there are places you cannot tread, there are places you cannot walk. So I ask this question, what is Jesus Christ doing in my life? What is he doing in my life to prosper me, to give me a job, to give me a husband? to give me a wife, to help me in my business. Is that what he's doing inside me? The answer is no. So find out. If you find it out, you will be on the same page with him. You will, you will walk. It will be easier for you to walk. It's, it's, it will be easier for you to walk in the Spirit. And I say the very reason why Jesus, what, why the Holy Spirit is inside of you is to work out God's purpose in your life. And what is that God's purpose in your life? That he will make you like Christ, be like Jesus Christ. The time for all these other things that we are looking at, the time is not now. It's to make you like Jesus Christ. And the way he does it, he prunes you, he chastises you, he rebukes you, he reproves you. He does all that and is not good to the body. The Bible says that no chastisement is good to the body at the present time. It doesn't sound well. It doesn't feel good at all. But that is the major reason why he is in your life, to correct you, to chastise, to prove, to do all that in order to bring out the person that he can offer to God because he is going to offer and present us to Jesus, to God. That's why he says he's washing the church with water by the word that he might present her to himself. So when, when you have this kind of understanding, living a Christian life will be easier for you. So that when the time of trouble and challenges and all of that comes, you don't buckle out, you don't buckle in, you don't give up, you don't find alternative, you don't withdraw, you don't draw back, you don't seek other means. Because there is only one way. Say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No other way. But why do people seek other ways? It's because of the same reason that they don't know him, they don't understand him. So the foundation is of essence. Jesus Christ being that foundation. And you hold on to him and him alone. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only name that is given by heaven, from heaven to man, 
The only bridge between God and man is Him. No other person. It is not Muhammad. It is not a no other, no other religion. We are not just like it. I said there is no other, and God has proved it. You know how God proved it? God proved that Jesus Christ is the only one He sent from heaven to mankind to be the propitiation of us, to be the, our redemption. You know how He proved it? How? Who knows? How God proved that Jesus Christ is the only one that He sent? He proved it in two ways. And it's evident. He raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. And the evidence is everywhere. I and again, the second reason, the second reason, the second reason he proved that he, Jesus is the only one that he sent is by the kind of mind boggling and miracles that you when you hear it, you stagger. And he does it effortlessly. A man died four days later, four days ago. He said, Let, let's go and wake him from sleep. Who has done that? And then we'll sit down and be calling and calling Muhammad, calling Islam, calling all this, whatever. They are nonsense. They don't exist. Those things are lies. Four days, put inside the grave, covered him, buried him, and covered him. Everybody went to open the grave. And people were mocking and they were laughing. Ah! He said, Lazarus, comfort. Then I will sit down and be and be and be arguing, arguing with you, whether Muslim or whether it is this or that, whether it's Boko Haram or whatever, and all those nonsense. The Bible says God has given the world to the sons of men. We are the ones that will decide what will happen or what will not happen until the Christians, until we rise. That's why he said, arise and shine. Until we, the Christians, the ones that are the light bearers, the light bearer, if we don't arise, God will not, the angels will not, because this earth, this world has been given to the source of, he didn't give it to the angels. He said, arise, shine, for your light is come. The glory of God is risen up. Look at miracles. Look at what he did. Which one do you talk about and leave the other? Mention them. When you talk about changed life, he came in a, a woman, an adulterous woman, Mary Magdalene, came in contact with this man. She became holy overnight. The woman of Samaria, he came in contact with this man. He, she became a saint. Who has done that? He spoke to a tree and said, no fruit will ever come before, out of you next time and all of that. The next day they came back, they saw him dry dead. They saw him walk on water. Go and walk on the water now. Go and walk. Enter Atlantic Ocean and walk. We must need we must we must know this man. The extent to which you know him is the extent to which you experience his glory and his power. As if to say that was not enough. As if that is not enough. They arrested him, crucified him. Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea begged and he was giving the body to go and bury. They buried him. The same people, the same people went to Herod and told him this deceiver that said that calls himself the king of the Jews. This deceiver said that in the third day, after three days, he will rise from the dead. He is not going to rise. He is his disciple that are going to do all those gimmicks and all of that and tell the world that is risen. Give us men, soldiers, let us go and guard that. He said, go, fortify it as much as you can. And they gave and they carried military men garrison of merit men surrounding the grave the first day the second day the third day he rose they saw what happened they were they were you know what is petrifying he said i don't know i don't their heart their hearts collapsed this their me could not carry them they were like dead men when they woke up they knew and they went and told them i said see what happened oh, that this man actually rose and there was nothing we could do about it. See the, our condition. They paid money to, and told them not to tell anybody that he didn't rise, but he rose from the dead. 
how do I know that same one? How do I know? My life is, that's what you do with evangelism. That's what you do in it. But when you are teaching or preaching to me, my life, I am a living witness. I'm a living witness that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Look at my life. Look at what he did. I'm a changed man. I'm no longer a liar. I no longer delight in evil. Even when I do it, I, I resent it. Even when I do something that is bad, I can't be comfortable with it. I will react. I will, I will, my heart will collapse. I will be mourning. I will be depressed. Because it's no longer my nature. It's about this man. So that it won't just be Jesus we are calling with ordinary mouths. Let's walk in the knowledge. Let's walk in the revelation knowledge of this man, Jesus Christ. There's no other name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved. Save that name, Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. For, I say he's alive. Very, very, very. He's alive. And he's alive forever. It is simple. It is simple faith. It is simple trust. In this name, we we'll do, we we'll do school of ministry. But then, anyway, anyway, this is part of it. It is just a simple faith in this name. These are the kind of things that when you hear it, you hear it. You don't just hear once. You don't just sit down and hear once like this. After that, when you are hearing it, you are doing like this, and then after that, you go home, and that will be the end. It won't profit too much. You hear it and you hear it and you hear it until this thing seeps into your spirit, into your spirit, man. That's where you can see a blind man and say, In the name of Jesus Christ that rose from the dead more than 2,000 years ago, I command these eyes to open because you know that he's still alive. So we talked all of that, then we talk about changed life, born again. The reason why we I told you many of us are not born again in the church because of lack of the message, the quality message. The gospel of Christ is the gospel of salvation. We don't preach it. We don't let people know. We don't preach the gospel of Christ. That's why Paul would say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of salvation. If you want to see results, then preach it. And what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ died. He rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. And what is the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom is that he's coming back again to establish his millennial reign. That's the gospel of the kingdom. So now, having heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is unto salvation, you need to now begin to hear about the gospel of the kingdom, about the coming. That's why he said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the earth, and then the end will come. Having preached the gospel of Christ, maybe, maybe I can um, help address this. But we're still going to meet it in um, maturity class, which is evangelism. There is a difference between evangelism and soul winning. They are not the same. Evangelism is this one off thing that you do. You enter the street and you go and preach. You evangelize. You finish. You go. Soul winning is to target someone, is to target some people. You're on your knees, you're praying for them until the light enters. When the light enters, they will see themselves the way they are, as sinners. They will cry out their heart for mercy for salvation and then they will be saved and then they will be converted so soul winning takes time evangelism is to go and scatter seed it's just like the person the sower went to sow he went to scatter seed some on the good ground some on the pathway some on the tonic ground some on this some on that that's what we do in evangelism so until we have men and women that are touched by God, that are born again, that have been transformed, that have been converted, 
These are the ones that you are going to be working with. These are the ones you are going to be investing in. Because any other thing that you are doing outside of these people being born again, you are wasting their time. It is very difficult because you don't have the ability. Remember the scripture that we shared in Ezekiel. He said, I will give you the power to obey my commandment. The ability is and is inside. And so when you are telling someone to obey God, to live a righteous life, when he doesn't have that ability inside of him, he can't. Because it's God that is will, that is working in you, both to will and to do. But he's not there yet. He's not inside of you. So you are telling the person to do this, to do that. He's just looking at He doesn't have the ability on his own. He can't obey God's word. A carnal minded man is in enmity with God because he is not subject to the law of God. He can't obey it. He doesn't have the ability to obey God's word. They slap you on this side, turn the other side. He can't do it. So we have, having said that, we talked about in building on the foundation that you're born again and everything else. Then you start building. Now, how do you build? By coming. That's why I say you come, you sit down, you listen, you hear, you understand, and then you do. Then that transformation takes place. Then that your faith begins to grow. That's how faith grows. So when you don't come to church, when you don't appear in Zion, and hear the word of God, not the word of man, and you hear the word of God, you can't grow. Your faith cannot grow. You can't be a strong Christian, and you can't please God. You can't be a friend of God. And like I said, if all that, you see First Corinthians 15, 19, if all that we have in this life, if all our hope in this life is just to eat and to drink, is just to work and have money to eat and to pay bills and all of that, the Bible said that we are the most miserable people that had ever lived. Look at it. So what he says is that this, this is not why we are here. And then, as you are hearing, you obey, your faith grows. You obey again, it keeps growing. The more you obey the word of God, the more you obey God, the more your faith continues to increase. So that's why you have weak faith, little faith, strong faith, and great faith. It grows. O ye men of little faith. Abraham not being weak in faith. Oh, I have never seen this kind of faith. This so great faith, not in Israel. Abraham not being weak in faith, but strong in faith. So there is weak faith, there is strong faith, there is little faith, and there is great faith. And all of them come through the hearing of the word and putting into practice what you have heard. And then it continues to grow. Stronger and stronger and stronger. So, and having said that, I talked about the nature of God's word. And I said, there is no comparison. The Word of God is, you know what the Word of God is in the natural? It's like this electric, electric. This, even this one is, is, has been stepped down. The Word of God is, the way you can compare the Word of God, the power of, the Bible said the Word of God is quick and powerful. The only way you can describe the Word of God is when you see this high tension wire. You know this, those why not the one that enters the, the transformer. No, not that one. The high tension, that one is, uh, that's how you can do it. That's the only way I can picture the word of God in the natural. You know, God uses, Jesus uses the natural to describe the spiritual. The only way you can use it, you can understand it, look at those high tension wires that crisscross desert and all of that. It, it, they are very high, very tall. I think there are usually three of them. Only go and touch it. Try, try and touch it. <laughs> you know what will happen? That's how the word of God is. But I said that word of God, you can make it of no effect. That same word, as powerful as it is, if you don't obey the laws that guard it, it will not produce that effect. And I said, if you have, if you don't believe in it, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. If you don't have faith, you cannot project. That word cannot. If you are not born again, it cannot. If you don't have faith, it cannot. If you are bearing malice and grudges against someone, it cannot. If you have sin in your life, it cannot. So there are laws. And then you cannot, you cannot project it on someone 
that has a curse on his life. It will not work. These are the laws until, but that same world can destroy that curse. If you know that curse in the life of that person, that same world will destroy it. If you know the application, if you know what to do, and that is about what we're going to be looking at, repentance, repentance from dead works. Luke chapter 24, verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That what should be preached? How many of you, since you are born again, have heard the message, have come to church and sit down and you hear have the message about repentance? You don't preach it again. Without repentance, your faith is zero. Not even zero is minus zero. Without repentance, your faith will be zero. There is no faith, there is no Christianity, there is no heaven without repentance. Repentance is what ushers you into the kingdom of God, what brings you in. So repentance is a message that must be preached. You know, many times we confuse confession with repentance. Just that the Bible said, if you confess your sin, I am just and faithful, I will forgive you and uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What is repentance? Repentance is a change, a change of mind. Eh? There is a change of mind. That change of mind will result to an outward action. There is a mind that is changed, and that your changed mind will result to an outward action. Let's look exactly like uh, at uh, Matthew chapter 21. But what do you think? A certain man have two sons. Let me just be paraphrasing it. A certain man has two sons, or you give me NL, NIV or NLT. A man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and walk in the vineyard today. The son answered, No. Dad, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and did what? Went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Both of them repented. But one repented positively. The other one repented negatively. The first one said, I will not go. Then, later, he had a change of what? Mind. And then, that change of mind resulted in the outward action, which is what? He went to the vineyard and did the work. That is what is called repentance. I want you to note this, because we are going to use it on Sunday, because there are a lot of issues that people are carrying. What do you call curse in Yoruba? Egbe. Egbe. A lot of people are carrying Egbe. Life is not normal. It's not the way you are looking at it. I keep telling you, I keep saying it, it will enter this way, fly away from this other side. When you bring an accosting in a house, the flow of the power of God will cease. Even, even if you are a pastor, you are church. Five years later, you are still where you are. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. 
The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pots he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm going, I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on a hired, as a hired servant. So he did what? He returned home. What happened here is called repentance. Many a times, you do something and you say you are sorry. Hmm? When you finish saying you are sorry, next time you will do the same thing. You have not repented. So saying sorry is not enough. It is not doing that in a game. It's not, it's, it is about not repeating that thing again. Because a lot of times we come to God and say, Lord, forgive me in Jesus' name, I have sinned. And then after that, next time again, you find yourself doing the same thing. The thing is that the reason is because you have not repented. And as long as that is what is going on, you take one step forward, you take two steps backward. Sometimes you take two steps forward, you take five steps backward. You are, not, you are not making any tangential move. You are just off and on. This is how, and your Christian life is not progressing. That's what we do. I am sorry. But the action, you keep repeating the same action. So how then can you say that you have repented? There is no repentance. So he returned home to his father while he was still a long way off. His father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Man, let me tell you something. I keep saying it. I have said it over and over and over. Because there are certain things that when we begin to talk about causes and all of that, the tendency is for you to feel overwhelmed and feel condemned and feel incapacitated. But I want to tell you something. Your case is not yet over. Do you know how you know that your case is not yet over? Do you know how you know? If you still have a heart to repent, if you still have a heart inside your chest to repent, you still have a hope. Your case is not over. Do you know why? Repentance is a gift from God. When God takes away the ability to repent from you, you become a reprobate. When God takes the power to repent from you, you cannot change. You cannot repent. Your case is finished. And once it's taken away from you, it can never be given you back. Repentance is a gift from God. When that is taken away from a man, that person becomes a reprobate person. You have a reprobate mind. You know what is a reprobate mind? Heart without judgment, fine. Your conscience is seared. Your conscience is mad. Your conscience, you don't have, you know when you say somebody doesn't have conscience anymore. There is nothing that you do that looks bad. As a matter of fact, you enjoy doing evil. You stay in it, you do it, you enjoy it. 
and you will smile and you will laugh. So that is how I know that your case is not yet over. Except you want to tell me that you don't have a heart of repentance anymore. But as long as you have it, you still have a bright future. I will reserve it on to a Sunday. But I will say one thing. I still one thing that has bothered me, eh, bothered me as a Christian, as a born again, not just as a pastor, as a believer in Christ. One thing that has bothered me, I have thought inside, outside, up and down, everywhere, right around. I said, how can someone born of God, genuinely born of God, is still living in squalor? Is still struggling. Life is a struggle and struggle and struggle. At the end of the day, you have little or nothing to show for you. What is actually going on? Is that the promise? I found out the reason. We are the architects of our problem. I'm going to open up furthermore, like I said on Sunday. Let me know because I keep having a pull to go back to it. But if I go, if I if I go to it now, I will not finish. We will not be able to do what we have to do today. Come to church on Sunday. We're going to deal with causes, generational causes, and non-generational causes. The problem that we have, you see, faith. You know, repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. That's why anywhere you see, you hear repentance from dead works. And the next thing you hear, faith towards God. Your faith will not walk outside of repentance. It is not just enough for you to say, I am sorry, but to repent of that sin. I'm going to show you what it means to repent and how you really do repentance. Because when we come on Sunday, we are going, I know we have done it last Sunday, but you know, you do something, people do it without knowledge. So I'm going to spend some time and teach on it and explain it and then we'll go into it and do the proper repentance and all of that so that you will be rest assured that you don't have any gory past in your life, that nothing is disturbing you, that nothing is withholding the flow of the life of God and the blessings of God in your life and in your generation so that you can be rest assured of it. What is the difference between the repentance of um, Esau and that of the prodigal son? You know about Esau, you know what he did? You know what Esau did? He sold his birthright. And then when the time came, his past came calling. He wanted a blessing, he could not get it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, 16. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. Give me King James Version. Let there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold his birthright, verse 17. For you know how that afterward he, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he had found, he had found what? No place for repentance. It was taken away from him. He couldn't repent. In Matthew 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is it that to us? See thou to it, to that. Verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now you don't get confused about the word repentance there. If you if you if you go to your if you go to your concordance, those who use concordance, you you check that word repentance. What you see there is remorse, guilt, remorse. That's what you see. You know, there is one there is one word that means several things or many things. Hmm? I've said it before, like in our place, there is what they call aqua. 
clothes. Aqua, cry with tears. Aqua, bed. Aqua, egg. It's the same A K W A. So some goes up, some goes like this, some goes this way. Aqua, 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 aqua. The main is same. So that is how it. Is. So you see, that's why I said there's no language that is complete. It is, languages came as a result of confusion in the Tower of Babel. So when you come here, there's somebody say you speak English. This one doesn't speak. Tell the person to go and sit down. Uh, yeah, this one can speak well. Can, can speak well, speak words. Say it any way you want to say, provided the person hears and understands what you are saying. Even if you are saying the person, I came today, uh, uh, I came, uh, I will come yesterday, I will come tomorrow. I will come tomorrow, and when I came tomorrow, I will saw you, and if I saw you tomorrow, then there will be no problem, we will settle our problem. Provided you understand what the person said, just move on with your life. Don't let anybody intimidate you. Is knowledge, oh, knowledge gives you power. Knowledge gives you, uh, it gives you confidence and the power. You might say all the technical things about it. it is all those technical, they are confusion. It is man that is creating all those things. Have you ever seen an arm robber that is caught? You catch an arm robber and he starts crying. And he says he's the devil. You will feel sorry for him, is it not? Don't feel sorry anything. He has not repented. Why he is crying is because he was caught. That is the reason. If he was not caught and he meets you in the house where he comes to steal, he will do the unthinkable. But once you catch him, he will start crying. That is called Koroko Dai Tears. That is called remorse. It's not genuine. Every genuine repentance will result to a new way of living. Every genuine repentance will result to a new way of living. If you are still living your old life, you have not yet repented. That was the reason why John the Baptist spoke to them. He said, you brood of vipers, who has called you and who has told you to run, from, run for your life? He said, bring you meat, worthy of what? Your repentance. We want to see the fruits, the evidence to prove that you have repented. Stop taking bribe. Stop lying. Stop cheating. Stop backbiting. Stop gossiping. Stop stealing. Put a stop to it. Then you know that you have repented genuinely. And then the power of God flows. See what happened to the, to the prodigal son. There is nothing, I'm yet to see something that is as powerful as repentance. No matter how down, no matter how deep, no matter how messy your life is. If you can come with genuine repentance, hmm? when God finishes with you, you will be better than those of them who have been there. Oh, that is what happened to his brother. The brother, the elder brother was there. He was living with his father, doing all the whatever. And then the younger brother collected his own birthright and then went and wasted it and then returned and fell on the ground and pleaded with his father. And the father forgave him and hugged him and through party, there was celebration. And then the elder brother got angry. When God, when you, when there is genuine repentance, you see, eh? that is why when you sit or stay with someone who understands this, they may do, the person might do something that is very bad. And you see that he did something very bad. Very, very, very bad. And then the next thing, you see the person broken, see the person crying, see the person mourning. And after that, he got up from that place and made a change of mind and a change of life. I will never do this. I will never go back to this again. If you see the kind of blessing, if you see the kind of grace, if you see the kind of glory and all of that that will come upon that young man, you will wonder. You will be asking, is God a partial? Because that is what happened between these two guys. Genuine repentance. And so when we're going to deal with the causes and all of that, genuine repentance is not this one that you say with your mouth, just empty words. Because Jesus said, you know, the first scripture that we read, he said that repentance and remission of sin must be preached. We must preach what repentance, genuine repentance is. When we don't have genuine repentance, your faith will not work. The power of God will not flow in your life. Struggle continues, yet the ability and the power and the glory and everything are available, but you can't access it. The reason is because 
we have not undertaken repentance. And why we have not undertaken it is because we don't understand what repentance is. We don't know how to repent. Give me Romans chapter 3 verse 25. It says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are what? The sins that are what? Through the forbearance of God. It is the past sins. I just want to highlight this. Because of these great, great preachers, he said once saved, you are forever saved. And even the sin that you are going to commit in the next 50 years have been forgiven. Look at this one. He said the sins that are forgiven are the past one, not the one that is in the future. It's your past sin. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. What has passed? Old. That is what he's saying here. Those people, they are liars. They are evil. They are not just bad people. They are evil. It's a sin that are past. Second Peter chapter 1 verse verse 9. But he that lacked these things is blind and cannot see afar of and had forgotten that he was purged from from new sins. Old. Not new. Is your, the one that you have committed and all of that in the past have been washed, forgiven and cleansed and you don't have any hold on it. And he doesn't have any hold on it. What he's saying is that you are responsible for what you do from now onwards. From now onwards, you are responsible for what you do. Jesus said to that young woman that was caught in adultery, he said, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. This one that you have done is forgiven, washed. You have no record of it anymore. But from now onwards, you take responsibility. Whatever you do, you're your own. It's just like somebody who has been in a debt. Maybe your brother, your sister, your cousin, and then he runs to you. Why are you inside into this kind of debt? Every day the police is coming and arrest you. People are calling and bringing police and arrest and all of that. You'll be sleeping in jail, in cell and all that. So what's the problem? You go carry something, uh, buy something, credits, something that you don't need and all. You got yourself into this mess. Anyway, I'm going to help you. I will pay clear these bills. Are you going to, are you going to pay for the bills is going to accumulate in the next one year in case it keeps on borrowing. Are you going to pay for that? Why? Because these are the questions you'll be asking all those who are grace preachers. Yet God has paid for your sin, even the one you're going to commit. So God is waiting for you to commit that sin. The Bible says, if any man sin, it's a different thing when you say, when a man sin. When means, I'm looking forward to your sin. I'm looking forward when you're going to sin. But if he said, if any man, he said by chance, by mistake, you are not meant to do that. Give me Hebrew chapter 10, 26. For if we sin, what? Willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Are you hearing it? Anyone that comes to Christ, if you are born again, if you are a child of God, you must take this God seriously. Is You don't play and joke with God. You don't just come and be playing with Him. After you have known the truth, and then you, you, have you heard people that say, I will do it and then I will repent. When I finish, I will repent. And listen to me. Listen very carefully. Listen, everybody. Don't talk to anybody. Don't do anything. Listen to me now. If I... Fred is standing here talking about Jesus Christ and living this life. There is nobody here. There is no man, no woman here, and even those who are not here, that cannot live a glorious, victorious life. If I can be this person that I am today, no other person that cannot be it. I'm telling you the truth. I know where I was coming from. There is nobody, no matter how twisted and complicated and frustrated, 
If I can stand here, there is no man, no woman that cannot stand. If God, that is what Paul said, if God could show me mercy, how much more? I don't know about you, but I don't think you have done half of what I did. And after that, God showed me mercy. And I'm standing today. So you can stand. I say you can stand. The thing is that the difference between maybe you and I is that the difference maybe is the difference may be that me, I made my mind up. You know what it means to make your mind up? I made my mind up. I wasn't going back again. When I crossed that bridge, I broke it. So that there would be no temptation or anything at all to go back. Just like the children of Israel, they wanted to go back to Egypt. My own, there was no. Ever since I received Christ, I broke that bridge. They, it was in those days, the kind of messages I was hearing, the kind of messages I preaching I hear and all of that. I hear messages about how somebody gave his life to Christ and he wants to go into ministry. He went and collected his certificates and everything that he has ever and burnt it. These are the kind of message I was listening in those days. Burnt everything. So there will be no temptation to go back and start looking for your certificate to go and get a job because you are being frustrated. If you make up your mind, all this one you today you are, you are I say your life depends on Jesus Christ. Your life depends on Christ. No other person. Life is empowered by the Spirit of God. And you must get acquainted with it. The other thing, no matter all you are running up and down and all of that, is not it. I've shown you God is the one that leads, God is the one that brings down. God is the one that puts a cost. That's the one he's the one that blesses. Let's talk about genuine repentance so I can clean up this other one. Steps in repentance. How can I make sure I have a genuine repentance? And when you undergo that repentance, when you have it, listen, there will God will restore. You know, he said in Proverbs chapter 6, he said he will restore all that you have lost over the years. There will be a restoration. When there is, okay, the first one, step in repentance, genuine repentance. First is humility. You must humble yourself. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. So that contrary words, you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Give me verse 6. What he's talking about here is that someone who had done something bad and the person down felt so bad and so down and so wounded. Okay? He became very humi- He became humble, humiliated as a result of what he did. Don't put much whatever because some of us, that's what the Bible says. When you see somebody who is falling, he say. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, or else you become, you have the same experience. So, meekness, humility, when you know that you have sinned or you have done something wrong, don't stand up and begin to justify yourself and give reasons. And before, signs of bad or false report, repentance signs how you know that your repentance is not genuine number one is when something happens and you are told about it and then you start justifying yourself why it happened giving reason why you why you stole money then you are giving reason why you did it there will be no repentance you can't that's what happened to them in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam sinned and God came. What have you done? Well, Lord, if not because of this woman you gave me, I wouldn't have had this problem. That's why no repent. Assuming Adam actually repented, we won't be in this state where we are. 
So he started justifying himself. What prevents you if you are confronted about what you did? Oh, I didn't say it that way. I'm truly very sorry. That is humility. You know, it seems difficult for us to say sorry. Hello? Especially our men, our husbands. They tell you that men don't say, sorry, men don't cry. Men don't say sorry. They say sorry in direct way. They say sorry in a, uh, they now go and buy gifts and be giving you and that. Hey, you are proud. You are a proud person. You are not a humble person. Let me tell you, I wish you are, you are not humble, you are proud. If you have done something, tell the person, tell your wife, I am sorry. That's humility. Jesus said, learn of me, for I am meek. I am lowly. You can't be lowly, you can't be more lowly than him. You can't be more meek than him. I am sorry, honey. On your knees, lift up your hands. I will receive all the punishments. Okay, I will not eat food today. Inez, humble yourself. Have a, have a humble heart. It's the same attitude we carry to God when we come to God. And it will be Korokodai tears. When you do not say sorry to your wife because of what you did, and then you now go to God and be saying, Lord, hey, hey, hey. And God will say, see your wife, go back and then reconcile with her first. Tell her that you are sorry. But if it is you, if it is you, why did you do that? He said, I'm sorry. It's not just, hey, I don't want to hear that you are sorry. Hey, is he sorry? Sorry for what? Sorry about this. Look at what you did, you are sorry. Sorry for what? Shall I, you understand? Psalm 51 verse 17. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. Is a heart that is broken, is a heart that is humble, is a heart that is meek, lowly. The Bible says God will never despise this. This is a journey of restoring your dignity, restoring your destiny, restoring your future, restoring your rights and your privileges in Christ. That you do not give Satan the opportunity to rob you of your inheritance anymore. Give me verse. Give me verse three, fifty-one. What is the next one? When you humble yourself before God, you know the Bible says, "Humble yourself before the Almighty God, and He will exalt you or lift you up." So humility first. I am sorry. Then the next thing is that you must acknowledge you have seen. Accept it. Take that responsibility. I take responsibility. I did it. I am sorry, Lord. Acknowledge your sins. Verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And so you are making the confession now. You humble yourself, you acknowledge your sins, you confess them. I lied to Tessie by telling her that I will come when I knew that I wasn't going to come. That's deception, that's a lie. I'm sorry, Lord. You confess, you say what it is that you are. Because it's not just enough, you say, please forgive me, I'm sorry. Sorry for what? I want to know what it is that you did. Because you might even say that, that thing that you did, you might even say, no, it's, it did it. it's not like that, too. It's not like that. So if it is not like that, then we're not, you're not ready for repentance. Then you ask for forgiveness. Oh, Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2. Be merciful unto me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. So you ask for mercy, you ask for forgiveness. I don't know why... Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy. Blot out my transgressions. So he began to say the things that he had done. I humble myself before you. I acknowledge I have sinned against you, and this is what I did. I'm truly sorry about it, Lord. Have mercy. And then, give me verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. 
Hide thy face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What is he saying here? It is what he said in Hebrews chapter 6, chapter 4, verse 16. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help. He is asking for grace. Renew the high spirit within me and all of that. Give me the ability so that I can live for you because the ability to obey is of God. I'm asking him to help me so that I will not repeat this again. Because it's not of him that will it, or of him that run it, but of God that showeth mercy. Then you now see, after you have done this, I've received that grace, and he gives you that grace. Because if you follow this father, he would definitely, I have done this thing over and over, and I have seen it. And that is what makes me, anytime I say something, and maybe I tell you that I'm going to come, and I didn't come my heart, you react. I react inside. I cannot tell you I will come. If I tell you I'm coming by 12 o'clock, I didn't say I will come today. If I tell you that I'm coming by 12 o'clock, if I don't come by 12 o'clock, that is a sin to me. I don't know about you. And I will go through this process. I didn't say if I tell you that I will come today, Wednesday, and I didn't come. If I say I'm coming by 3 p.m., my 3 p.m. should be my 3 p.m. If I don't come by 3 p.m., it's a sin. I consider it as a sin to me. And I do this. See, eh? the closer you get to God, hmm? the closer you get to God, the more careful, the more you repent. The closer you get to God, the more you repent. Not repenting of uh, those little, the Bible calls, in the book of Song, Songs of Solomon, he calls it the little foxes that destroys the vine. There are little, little things like that. You make a promise, you don't keep it. Ah, and you are normal. You won't have faith. What that thing you are calling faith is not faith. There is what is called living faith. It's the other people that gave it. Say it's a living faith. There is a faith that is alive. There is one that is dead. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thy altar. You see, there has to be a transformed life. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse 8. It was, he said, bring forth therefore fruit, meat for what? Repentance. What does he mean? Let me see the evidence of your repentance. You cannot say that you are sorry you have done this and all of that, and then you go back again and continue the same thing. There has to be a transformed life. There has to be a change. Evidence. And then, after you have done that, the final one is that you have to take responsibility for whatever it is that you have done. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20. You take responsibility. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your fault, you shall take it what? Patiently. Sometimes you suffer for the consequences of your offense. Sometimes you suffer for it. You take it patiently. The grace of God is going to see you through that. If somebody is walking on me, flirting up and down and doing whatever and all of that, and then in the course, you commit, you are sleeping around and in the process, you caught AIDS. And then you go to God and repent and will God forgive you? Yes. But the pains, the aftermath, you bear it. Or you did it and then you got pregnant. And ask God for forgiveness, God will forgive you. But He's not going to kill that pregnancy. You're going to give birth to that baby. I'm going to carry the responsibility. If you are a pastor, there is a pastor that was, um, he committed the offense in the church and then they sanctioned him. And um, he, he took offense. Why? After all, I have repented, I confessed, I repented, I did everything and all of that. You still told me not to preach 
and all of that. How am I going to survive? He took offense. He has not repented. He has not. Because God is still training and working on you. That is why, and God uses human beings, He uses the church, He uses the pastor, He uses your fellow body, your fellow brothers and sisters to do all this. That's why you need to understand the workings and the dealings of God. So we talk about this, and then we talk about faith towards God. When you have done that, you can now be rest assured your faith will come alive. And briefly, we'll be hearing this message of faith. We've heard about faith towards God and faith towards God. These are actually what gives rise to your faith. The struggle of faith, the struggle with faith and all of that will come to an end when you master repentance. When you know that when you do something, you don't go back doing that thing again. When, when God has seen the state of your life and your heart and all of that, He showers grace upon you. Your faith will come alive. Because if not, we'll be hearing the we'll be hearing the message you've been teaching, you reading the Bible, we'll be hearing it and all of that. And even your and sometimes we we'll pray, pray out of unbelief, and that when you finish praying, you are even not sure whether God heard you or not. How many of you are like that? You finish praying, you didn't know whether God actually heard you or not. I used to be like that. But he hears. But if you have issues and troubles in your heart and all of that, it's because of that. You want your faith to be solid and be strong. Make sure your heart is clean before God. Repent. Turn away. Stop telling people you will you will see them tomorrow and you will not come. Stop telling people you will come and you will not come. Stop stop making empty promises. It kills and lavishes your faith. It is not right. It's, the Bible says he that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. You can't make promise to people because he said, let your word be yea and amen. Because that is how Christ is. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be what? No. Learn how to say no. Learn it, how to say no to people. Don't be a yes brother, yes sister. I'll call you now to come. He say you are coming. Pastor, consider it done. I'm there. The whole day you will see him. If you're not coming, say, Pastor, I'm sorry, I, my hands are full. I won't kill you. I will know. It's better that way. You tell me the truth. I know that you are faithful and deep. I can trust you. Rather than telling somebody you are coming. And that's what destroys your faith. Tomorrow you wonder why the faith is not working. You wonder why you say in Jesus' name, come out, and it doesn't come out. That's why when they say, come and cast out this devil, we are doing deliverance. Faith is lacking. Something that destroys faith is sin. Sin is an enemy of faith. And what you call sin, when you talk about sin, the only sin that we have known is sin of fornication, sin of adultery. That's the one that you know. Sin of stealing. You don't even consider stealing sometimes as sin. I say when you tell somebody that you are coming by 12 and you don't come by 12, that is a sin. When you come late to church, he did that nowhere to do good and do it, it not. Give it to me. James 4 to 17. Yeah. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? You see what sin is? Sin destroys faith. It is not just what you did, it is what you failed to do. As a matter of fact, the very first sin that man committed was the sin of omission. What he failed to do. Keep the garden, keep the place secured and all of that. He was delinquent. He kept quiet. He didn't do it. Then the enemy sat and sneaked in. Your faith, no matter how we shout it, no matter how you read the Bible, no matter how you confess it, faith is a spirit. That spirit will not come, will not enter you. Faith is a spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 13 tells us that faith is a spirit. Sin is also a spirit. Having therefore the same spirit of faith, have you seen it? We have a spirit. It is a spirit. So he's not just shouting and talking and all of that. If that spirit is not in it, he doesn't know where to do good. You know that it is right for you to come to church on time, and you do not come on time to church. You have sinned. And if you have sinned, what do you do? If you confess your sin, I'm just and faithful, I will forgive you and will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so you came late to church today, you repented. Tomorrow, you come late, you repent again. The next day you come late again, you repent. You are not repenting in the first place. You didn't go through that process. 
and then they come to a point where you ask him to give you the grace. Ask for the grace to help you. Hebrew 10, Hebrew 4, 16. The grace to help you in the time of need. Ask for the grace. For it is God that is at work in you, both to will and to do. Ask him for the doing grace, the ability to come on time. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you come to the presence of God, you ask him for this grace to do X, Y, Z. And he will give you. And the Bible says, remember, he said he gave it grace to the humble. And because you have had a humble heart before you, that grace is guaranteed. You know what? Because God wants to see, he wants to see us live a life of righteousness. The righteous is as bold as lion. The righteous, the wicked runs when even nothing is pursuing him. Righteousness exalts, it promotes and blesses and prospers. Sin is a reproach. Jesus hated iniquity and he loved righteousness. And therefore, God anointed him over and above all his fellows. Righteousness. If you live a life of all these pretenses, all these uh, uh, holier than thou, you know all those things we do in the secret and all other pretense, you won't be there. And your faith will be. You know what is righteousness? Righteousness is when you do believe what God tells you and do it. That is called righteousness. That is why the Bible says concerning Abraham, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed to him as what? Righteousness. He believed God. What did he believe God? What did God tell him? Leave your father, your mother, your country, and all of that to a land I will show you. And he believed God and he left. And the Bible said he was considered righteous because he did what God said. That's what is called righteousness. Obedience to the word of God. That is what is called faith. Obedience to the word of God. That is what is called trust. Obedience to the word of God. That is what is called belief. It is not a rocket or it's not let nobody confuse you. It is simple obedience to God's word that produces righteousness. The more you do it, the more your trust in him grows. The more and then you can please God because he said, Without faith you can't please me. Hebrews chapter eleven verse six. For without faith it is impossible to please God. And anyone that comes to God must believe that he is. And he rewards those of them that diligently seek him. Without, if you want to live a righteous life, then live a life of obedience to God's word. You want to live a life of holiness, obedience to God's word. When he says, touch not the unclean things, come out from among them. I will not touch anything that is unclean. I will come out from among them. You see unclean things. If you touch unclean things, curse will come. The blessing will not come. I remember I, I was listening to the reprint. He said he had been a minister for many years, and in his ministry, nothing was happening. Nothing, he was just weird to it. He was just struggling. No money, no nothing, bills to pay, a mountain, and all of that. So when he began to study about causes and effects and all of that, he discovered that there was one artifact, something, one painting, or uh, whatever, that his great great grandfather, he, they kept, you know, he, giving it to their children, children and children. So he came to his own part time, his own time. Uh, they gave him and he used it and placed it on the wall. It was one day. He said one day somebody visited him in the house and all. I said, "What is this thing?" He said, "Oh, he's um, one of his, my." Parents and grandparents gave us. And, uh, say this thing is demonized. Is um, is an accosting. And if you keep it in this your house, you cannot prosper. Nothing in this your life works. He said he struggled for a while and all of that, but out of obedience to God and all of that, he removed it and burnt it. It wasn't up to one week like home video. His bills that he had been owing and all of that paid. His ministry blew and began to take a new dimension and all of that comes across things. We will stay on it for a while, this particular topic. I will be dealing with it every week until I am satisfied that we have come a long way.
how does faith come? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you have faith here. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Okay? So if you want to have faith, what do you do? You go to the word of God first. You must hear it. And not just hearing. There is another aspect of hearing, understanding. You hear, you understand. Then faith comes. You hear the word, you understand the word. Give me Matthew 13, 40. Matthew 13, 18. The parable of the sower. Verse 19, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and does what? What happens? You see what happens? When you preach, when people hear the word of God and they don't understand it, what happens is that the devil comes, take it away, dry your life. So seek to hear and understand. Seek to hear and understand. Don't just come to church for the sake of coming to church. Build your faith so that it won't be at the end of the day you're looking for who to go and borrow from, who to go and ask for. It doesn't matter whether you have money or you don't have money, whether your parents have money or they don't have money, whether you don't need anybody's help. The help that you need is from God. It is God that you need help from. It is God that can help you, not man. Don't put your trust in man. Don't be hoping that or looking forward to, okay, when they finish, I'll go and ask, uh, you know, you make a mental note or write down in your paper. I'm going to ask this person, ask this person, ask this person. Now, by the time I ask one, two, three, four, I would have raised the money in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the entrance of your word. Gives light is a lamp unto our feet, is a light unto our path. We have uh, exceeded our time by four minutes past eight. Lord, we can understand we are trying to get the message across to each and every one of us. I thank you so far, how far, so far, what we are doing in our lives. Everyone that appeared in Zion in these days, Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that which you have designed for them from their womb, from the day they were brought, they were brought in, into this life. Lord, you said you are the one that began this good work. You will never fail, and you have said it, you are faithful, and you bring everything that concerns them to come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord of oh God, I pray that you reorganize their life where there have been accidents spiritually and all of that. We are in the process of restoring, we are in the process of restructuring, we are in the process of repair. Every life, every destiny must be repaired and brought back to his original state where God has designed for you to be. And that is what you are going to be and you will eat the good of this land in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. May the hand of God continue to rest on you. May the grace of God continue to be with you. May the face of God continue to shine upon you. May God continue to strengthen you in the name of Jesus. That you will grow from grace to grace, from faith to faith, from power to power, in the name of Jesus. And you will break forth. You are going to break forth and your, shine, your light will shine. You will no longer be in obscurity in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to your name. We invoke the blood of the everlasting covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ, over your life, over your destiny, over everything that has to do with you. We invoke the blood of Jesus, the blood that speaks of better things than the blood of Abel, in the name of Jesus Christ. We dismantle and clear anything that is not of God in your life that has stood in the way of enjoying your right and your privileges in Christ. We command them to be lifted in the name of Jesus and entrance be granted you into the abundance of the riches of Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. God bless you.